Good evening and welcome to the City Talks. I don't want to, I don't want to mess it up for a speaker though. This is, but you'll come back, right? I'm Jordan Sangaras in history and I'm one of the members of the Urban, Urban Studies Committee at UVic that organizes uh, these sessions with the support of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences and units across uh, campus and we're joined by the uh, really the leader of the urban studies uh, group, Ruben Rose Redwood, who's there in geography, and uh, also associate dean in social sciences. Hi, Ruben. Um, I want to start by acknowledging, uh, or, or by stating that we acknowledge and respect. Uh, there's a distinction between acknowledging with respect and acknowledge and respect uh, that was recently explained to me. Uh, the Lekwungen people on whose traditional territory the university uh, stands, and this university facility that we're in, and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich people whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. Uh, it's a real pleasure to introduce the last of these three uh, talks this semester that ask us to contemplate what Victoria might look like post-pandemic, uh, or think about what is this late pandemic? I don't know, you know, Anita might be able to answer these questions better than I can. Um, but uh, think about this stage of the pandemic and where we might uh, be headed. Uh, Anita Ho is a bioethicist uh, and health services researcher with a unique combined academic training and experience in philosophy, clinical organi uh, organizational ethics, public health, and business. And she's also a piano player. And I think that appears in one of your uh, bios somewhere. I saw the piano player. Uh, she's a bioethics faculty member at both UBC and the University of California in San Francisco and the regional director of ethics at uh, Providence in Northern California. An international scholar and author of more than 70 publications, Anita is particularly interested in systemic and social justice issues arising in healthcare, domestically and internationally. Her COVID-related research has been focusing on global disparity in resource allocation, the role of trust in pandemic communication, which has had a really interesting history in BC here, I think, and the ethical dimensions of digital public health uh, surveillance. Broadening on the theme of digital health monitoring, uh, 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 broadening on the theme of digital health monitoring, Anita is currently completing a book manuscript on the ethics of using artificial intelligence in Health Monitoring, which uh, will be published soon by the Oxford University Press. Her talk this evening, which will be followed by a Q&A in this intimate gathering, is entitled Victorian Global, Citi Citi Victorian Global Citizens, excuse me, Solidarity in and Out of a Pandemic. Thank you, Anita. Thank you so much for doc to Dr. Joanne Stanley Ross, as well as uh, Dr. Ruben Rose Redwood, and thank you so much for all of you for, to all of you for joining tonight on one of the rare dry days uh, in this winter. And I also want to acknowledge and respect that we are on the land of the Lakwani people, and I also want to acknowledge the sacrifices that um, the Songhees, the Esquimalt, and Wasanish people have made uh, in their relations to this land. But I also partly want to acknowledge and recognize not just sacrifices, but a lot of the policies that we have continued to have that may continue to disadvantage some populations than others. And what I'm hoping to do today is to really think about some of the policies we have in relation to healthcare, in relation to how we think about our role in this pandemic and how we get out of this pandemic. So as part of thinking about our land that we're on together, uh, I really like the work of Christy Balco, who's one of the 90s artists in Canada. And I, if you, might, uh, you may allow me to say this quote by her. The plants are teachers. They're connected to each other and all other spiritual things through the sacredness of life. When I remember who I am, a human being connected to all of life, I remember also that I am loved by the spirit world and our ancestors. And when I remember this, I remember to respect even the smallest of things. And I really like the whole idea about the connectedness of all of us. Uh, but the connectedness also in, in a different sense too. The way connected, we're all affected by the pandemic, but in many ways quite differently. And even for myself thinking, having a faculty position, having a hospital position, and being able to come back to Canada, 
and, and at some point I'll be going back to the U.S. and I have to get COVID tests again. And being able to even afford to pay for the tests and to be able to travel, uh, to me is all privileges, but somehow in, in some ways I also have to think about how do we think about some of the disparity issues that we are all facing, whether it's in relation to our daily movement, uh, our access to healthcare, our access to vaccines, or other kinds of very basic necessities. So, and then what does that mean for all of us? Uh, the title of the talk is a little bit of a wordplay uh, that we're not living in Victorian time when we are all separated, uh, but now that we're, we're trying to also think about how do we, in some ways, also want to separate from other people. If we have enough separations, enough distance from other people, we might be able to keep ourselves and each other safe. But at the same time, there's also a lot to be said about the connectedness that is actually helping our spiritual safety, our mental health, and that we also have to, also have to think about as well. So, uh, being Asian, sometimes people will often ask me, like, where are you from? And I'm using this headline to actually mean a couple of different things. Part of the reason why I've got really interested in global health issues and the global connectedness is, I've often wondered about what does that mean by where somebody is from. So we, when we are on native lands, and people talk a lot about their relationship with the land, their ancestors, and so on. So I was born in the British colony of Hong Kong. And so when people ask me where I'm from, I often would say I'm from a colony. But myself being from a colony and my relationship with that land and then moving away from that colony into Canada uh, and to other places. I live in Canada, I've lived in the United States, which is also where I spend most of my time right now. I also worked in Singapore for a few years. Uh, some of my research work has been in Sub-Saharan Africa, including Uganda, Rwanda, and South Sudan. One thing that I've seen is how suffering is often, in many different kinds of ways, very common and universal. But some people suffer more than others, or some people's suffering is treated as less important than others. And I've never really understood why that's the case. And, and so part of what I really want to think about, and I uh, co-authored a couple of pieces on this during the pandemic, is why are we thinking that? And how do we as normal, quote unquote, normal citizens actually think about our responsibility in getting not just ourselves, meaning like me and my family, out of the pandemic, but everybody together as well. So again, like I said, so we, how do we you know, move from you know, in the Victorian era, the splendid isolation, to now being very globally connected? And everywhere we're thinking about is how uh, Particularly with this pandemic, we know that how we could travel from one place to another very quickly, very easily. It can, we can also have a lot of community transmission as well. So, but if we want to keep any kind of global connections, then I think that we also have to think about what would be our global responsibilities, individually and as a citizen and as part of um, a global community as well. And I think that our connectedness is partly about how we collaborate with each other so that we can benefit from each other. Um, but there's also that question in terms of connectedness, I think in a, in a more negative or concerning kind of way, is that many things that we're doing would have direct effect on what other people may or may not be able to access. And so that as somebody who studies and works in ethics, and that concerns me a lot. Um, how is it that many of our policies are by design um, even though we might not think that way, but by, by design would benefit certain populations over, over others. And which means that by design, some of the communities would get out of COVID much quicker than others. Or at least that's what we think we can do. Because we're now also looking in, uh, to Europe, which is having another surge again. So it's actually quite quickly that things can go um, out of control again. And I think that this whole COVID pandemic the, the last 20, how many months, I, I'm losing count now. Let me think here. 20, more than 20, 20 plus months, right? How what we're seeing is really actually in some ways not really that surprising. And I think um, the speaker from last month talked about that too. That this is not the first time that we have a pandemic. And I think this is also not the first time that we're seeing different results for different communities. So how is it that when we see things going on and on over and over again that we are still not able to correct that. 
So some of the numbers that you may have already seen in the news and, and uh, in the media, there are currently around the globe that at least 24 vaccines that have been approved by at least some government. So uh, in Canada, we have a few vaccines. In other places, they may have different vaccines. They may have different vaccines for various kinds of reasons, partly because of cost. Um, in Canada, we have ordered enough, even early days, to vaccinate more than five times the population. Um, so, you know, if, if all the supplies do come, we really don't have to worry about a shortage. Right now, I think some of the concern is really more about whether we can make sure that everybody is vaccinated. Uh, everybody who wants to get vaccinated is vaccinated. And people who are not vaccinated, if there may be misinformation or other kinds of access concerns, access concerns doesn't have to be just about vaccine availability, but it may be also, can people take time off work if they were to get sick? Uh, if they cannot actually miss time from their hourly um, uh, salary, salary work. So other high income countries like Australia, more than 4.6 times, and the UK, more than four times. So there were lots of discussions about whether we are in a situation where there may be vaccine hoarding of, um, by some of the more richer countries. The average vaccine cost uh, is currently somewhere between $2 US to $37. Now, if, if, if you're a Canadian, relatively high income, we don't have to pay for the vaccines right now, like in terms of people getting vaccinated, uh, but you can imagine what that may mean to the health system for some of these places uh, that may not have the same kind of uh, resources. Distribution costs as well. We may not individually have to pay for the distribution, but your health system will still have to pay for that. So in lower income countries, the average annual per capita health expenditure is only about $41. So you can already see that like if you somehow have a bad uh, agreement with one of the pharmaceutical companies, and then plus the, also the distribution costs, just one dose may completely wipe out your annual cost for that person. So what that would mean too is that it's going to leave some places much more vulnerable. Right? How are you going to be able to get people vaccinated? How are you even going to be able to get the vaccine to, to start with? So the, the WHO now really wants to make sure that we have global vaccine coverage of 70% of the population by mid-2022. 70%. Where are we in Victoria? 90%. Is that right? So, and today is only in November 2021. Right? So when I think about how, you know, when Dr. Henry and any others who have been really encouraging people to get vaccinated to say, to say, don't wait at all, you have to get it now. And then we're seeing to some populations around the world that mid-2022 is good enough. And that's only 70%. So there's still 30% of the population who won't even be getting the first dose yet. So I, I keep thinking that even in the rich countries that are really encouraging people to get vaccinated, unless we are really doing everything we can, we are really sending mixed messages. Right? Either you really, you mean everybody really has to get vaccinated, like as soon as possible, and that's why we really have to make sure the vaccine availability is there for everyone who needs it, uh, or something isn't quite right. As I mentioned, uh, in, in terms of the vaccine cost, so for high income countries, Canada would be part of it. Uh, the, the increase of the healthcare spending um, in, in getting the vaccines available is only less than 1% of how much we, we are covering for um, vaccinating 70% of the population. And remember, the, the, by 2022, mid 2022, the WHO is hoping that 70% of the world population will get vaccinated. But in the lower income country, they would have to increase their health healthcare spending by more than 56%. So again, then to think about how do they actually afford doing that? What may be some of the reasons for the higher cost? And for many of these healthcare systems, they already were, um, I don't want to say necessarily on the brink of collapse, but they're really trying to stretch whatever resources they may have. So when we put that together to say, now we have to add another 56%, and at the same time, you may have other kinds of health needs that are being also put aside, then we can imagine how that would be a much 
higher kind of burden on, on some of these regions. And this slide shows you some of the disparity and the progression, or the, uh, I guess in some ways, how, we, how, come, how far we have come for higher income countries in comparison to the lower income countries. So if you look at the high income countries uh, at the top, kind of a sort of purple line there, between December 2020 to October 2021, um, the, the total COVID vaccines administered per 100 people has been already almost 140, which means that many people have got the two doses if they, if they require the two doses. Um, and we'll see that also about the additional doses as well. But if you look at the low income country, that red line at the bottom, it almost looked like it has not moved at all since December. It's a tiny, tiny little um, you know, increase there. So that's the disparity. The disparity is really to see, like, not just at the beginning, but how far we have come, supposedly, for the higher income countries. And so that's why people are really concerned. The WHO, the World Health Organization, is very concerned about some of the disparity and asking, actually, various countries to do more uh, in various kinds of ways. If you look at the vaccination divide, um, percentage of populations who are at least partially vaccinated in the higher income countries, uh, at least 72% um, of one dose, uh, versus the low income country, at least one dose, only about 4.4%. So how do we actually reconcile that in, in, in a pandemic? So the pandemic really requires that we all get vaccinated, because otherwise, if we're not all protected, um, that we're all vulnerable. So one question that has come up quite a bit, and I've been asked by the media as well, what do we do with quote-unquote booster shots? Right? The World Health Organization has asked higher income countries to hold off on that, partly because many countries, as I just showed, uh, still have not got their first shots. And I do want to distinguish booster shots and the additional shots for people who are immunocompromised. So there are people who are immunocompromised, which means that the two shots that they have got are actually not enough for the basic immunity for them, okay? Uh, the booster shots will be for people who might be like myself, uh, who otherwise don't have underlying conditions that make me more susceptible to COVID. Um, but this is to bolster my protection. And there is still you know, some debate in terms of whether that is necessary for healthy younger adults um, who may not otherwise be immunocompromised. So the Dr. Michael Ryan from the World Health Organization said, well, for those people who are otherwise healthy, in health, uh, particularly in high-income countries, in high-income countries, it's not only just that you have vaccines to protect you, we have other protective equipments like people here right now wearing masks. You may also live in places, if you have stable housing, uh, that you may also have enough space to separate from each other. When we're shopping, when we're doing other kinds of daily activities, there may still be other dividers and so on to protect. So vaccine may be the, not the only thing. So Dr. Ryan said that in those situations, it would be as if we are throwing two life jackets to somebody uh, where other people are drowning. So do we actually need to do that? Uh, how do we actually think about that? And WHO said that basically the booster shots, so for people who are getting the extra, quote unquote, extra protection, not, not the, the basic immunocompromised protection, uh, are administered six times more often than primary doses in low-income countries each day right now. So if you look at some of the wealthiest nations, uh, the 71.2 million doses uh, of booster shots in high-income countries um, by, by November versus 43.4 million doses for the basic doses there. So this is how, how, they're, how we're, when we're rolling out, and we remember too that there are not as many high-income so this, this is why that the proportion um, seems a bit concerning to um, some, some countries that are really still trying to wait for the first dose. Now, to be fair, there have been already some efforts to improve access or to at least try to gain some access for people in various parts of the world. So the COVAX, the Global Alliance, of, uh, the COVID-19 Global Alliance for Vaccines is really trying to make sure that it's a consortium that we can order more vaccines to be distributed across the world. 
The goal initially was to deliver 2 billion doses of the vaccines of different types to lower income countries by the end of 2021. So we are now about a month and a half away. Um, but the reality is that we have only been able to deliver about one quarter of that goal, which is why we're still waiting to see what will happen by mid-2022. There have certainly been other glitches uh, in, in terms of supply chain. And, uh, you probably remember, particularly earlier this year, when there was a major surge in India with the Delta variant. What that meant was that the many uh, vaccines that, that India was producing, which actually is a major uh, contributor, the doses being produced in India was a major contributor to the stockpile for COVAX, uh, that they had to halt that because they were not enough uh, for the people in India. Uh, the supply chain is now getting better, but it is still quite slow. Okay. So there have been certainly questions too, that even in early days, that should we, we mean in Canada or other more high income countries, use a much more protectionist um, lens to think about how do we protect our people first, our whatever that means, like in our country, in our jurisdiction first, uh, before we would distribute to other places. Some of you may remember that Canada, I think, contributed I don't know, like 400 some million dollars for the COVAX um, supply, but with the possibility of also buying from COVAX as well. Initially, part of the goal is that, well, if you invest in COVAX, because COVAX is now trying to get um, contracts with different vaccine producers, that in, in the early days, the hope was that, well, you never know whether the first vaccine that comes out will work for everybody. So if you have a variety of vaccines, then you may be able to actually have more supplies. Um, but there are certainly concerns too about the unequal negotiating power. COVAX was concerned about how, because they have to get donation funding as well, that how are we making sure, remember I showed that the cost for each vaccine is somewhere between $2 US and 30 some dollars. Um, so many governments are directly uh, negotiating with pharmaceutical companies in terms of their contract. So some of these companies may be able to then meet those demands first before they actually give the doses to COVAX. And companies that are, or countries that are donating to COVAX also want to say that we want to make sure that our people have enough first. Which of course raises the question, how many would be enough? How many per Canadian would be enough? Burundi, one of the very small countries um, neighboring Rwanda, just received its first, uh, first COVID vaccine doses last month, was in October. Um, so that's 10 months after for example, the U.S. started getting vaccinated. So when we have bilateral agreements between countries and, and the companies that buy up some of the limited supply, then it will be the case that some of these uh, other countries will continue to be um, disadvantaged across, a across this particular pathway. My concern is also partly that it's not just about vaccines. So, uh, I already mentioned how there, there's a disparity in terms of the vaccine distribution. But this pandemic is also affecting other sectors as well. So we have multi-sectorial, multi-level disruptions, which also means that people in various parts of the world may be much more susceptible to getting sick, whether it's from COVID or other kinds of conditions. Childhood immunization has been uh, suspended in many places with polio and measles partly because they have to shift very limited uh, healthcare providers, uh, personnel, and other equipment to, for, uh, for any kind of COVID care, related care. Other supply chains, even for other types of protective equipment, masks, gloves, and so on and so forth, uh, were also disrupted. So in some places, they also have to then decide, are we going to perform any type of surgery or do other kinds of diagnostic tests that may require the use of other protective because if you need to save the protective equipment specifically for COVID purposes, then other kinds of conditions may also be going by the wayside. Some of you probably have heard of family members who had to delay care, their elective surgery have been um, also postponed, and so on and so forth. 
There are also human resource concerns um, that tie to what I was talking about already, and shifting uh, healthcare providers. And, but of course, in some places where people, uh, healthcare providers did not have enough PPE, the uh, personal protective equipment, some of them also got sick uh, and also died. So there is also this question in terms of how in some countries that the human resource concern got exacerbated as well. The other levels of disruption that even happened in Canada is school closures and, and parents who have to uh, be now working as well as taking care of the kids, which is even more work. Um, so, and when we also talk about school closure, there are other kinds of developmental disadvantages that children may be going through. So there may be questions in terms of how that may be also an intergenerate, intergenerational uh, disadvantages as well. Fragile economies, especially if we, if we have to think about how to spend more money on protective equipment, uh, vaccines, and so on. That means that now they're even further burdened. And some of the economies that may have required uh, tourism or other kinds of you know, import export industries, and because we're not able to have those activities, so some of these economies are also continuing to be um, affected. The lack of infrastructure, which is actually part of the reason why some places could not get certain types of vaccines like the Pfizer vaccines, that initially the whole problem about the deep freezers uh, was a major concern for places that don't have electricity uh, or don't have the capacity. So that, that really raises questions in terms of should we develop um, or use licensing agreements to allow different places to produce their own vaccines so that it can be more um, tailored to the local environment. I mentioned earlier that how many of us do have more privileges because of the living conditions that we're in uh, to be able to isolate, even if you got exposed, if you got sick, uh, in, compared to, in comparison to many places that have very crowded living and working conditions. And in some places that people may actually not have the luxury uh, to stay at home. So I mentioned about living in the U.S. right now. A lot of the populations in the U.S. that have been most affected are the Latinx population, for example, African American populations, who would not be able to afford uh, not having a paycheck and not being able to afford uh, working from home because their jobs are requiring them to be at grocery stores, construction sites, or delivery uh, that actually don't pro provide them with the protection of having safe distancing as well. So how do we actually think about all those forces coming together uh, and thinking about how there is actually a pathway of the disparity that many places are going through? Yulia Descalo uh, is one of the medical students at UBC and she has been working on how do we think through some of the global disparity and solidarity in this pandemic. And one of the concerns, and I have, I've brought up already, how we are actually really looking at a disparity pathway. We have been focusing a lot on vaccine uh, availability, but actually if we really look at the whole pathway, Many places, many people in these places have already got the pre-existing disease burden and the baseline susceptibility. So many places, people already have lots of other malaria, other kinds of um, infectious diseases that are plaguing those communities already. And so that when they have various kinds of respiratory conditions and not also have the infrastructure to care for people, then they're even more susceptible to very, very poor health. The limited disease prevention resources, limited education, limited community health workers, and of course limited uh, physician availability as well. So without that, the many people who might want to protect themselves, they're not able to do that. And then when you get sick, you also don't have adequate access to health care, uh, essential drugs, uh, and also clinical trials. So there may be concerns that many drugs that we are able to have in Canada or the U.S., they have never actually been tried or um, delivered in some of these other countries, partly because of drug costs uh, and partly because of whether there are also ethical questions too, to run clinical trials in certain countries when pharmaceutical companies decided that the market would not be quote unquote worthwhile for them, partly because of um, cost of drugs and so on. So the disparity pathways, I think, one of the reasons why I really think that we 
have to think more from a solidarity perspective. If we, maybe for some people it's a big if, uh, but if we really think about the common good and the, and the shared humanity. My dad passed away a few years ago, and one of the things that he would often say is that nobody actually gets to choose where you're born. If you're born in a particular place, you have no choice. Your parents may have had a choice to decide whether to have children or not, but you didn't have a choice, you didn't have a say to decide where you would be born, whether to be born. Um, so the questions in terms of how is, in some ways, really very much of a luck thing. Is it really a matter of luck that somebody might be born in a certain place and not others? John Rawls was a Harvard uh, political philosopher who wrote this uh, a very uh, influential work, uh, A Theory of Justice in 1971, where he talks about a veil of ignorance, and I will explain a little bit. But basically the idea that he wants us to think about is that, well, if you really come to think about what kind of society we want to live in, there would be actually good self-interested reasons for us to really adopt um, a, a, the ethical principle or structure of society that would actually protect all of us, particularly those who are least and we are actually, we have good self-interest to do that. In COVID, and I think that's exactly right, partly because we need global herd immunity. It's not just enough to have Victoria because people like me come into Victoria. And then other people may be going outside of Victoria uh, and then coming back. So in, unless everyone is protected, we are not protected. So John Ross talks about this veil of ignorance. What he said is that, well, imagine that you're in this original position, meaning that we don't have you know, social structure yet. We don't know what the society may look like. You have some kind of idea that in society, so there will be different characteristics. Um, so the different color of skin, the people who are more frail, the people who are born female, the people who are born not female. And there are people who may have various kinds of impairments or, and have mobility impairments and so on. You don't know who you are at this point. Okay? Um, if you don't know who you may end up being, what do you think the type of society would be the just one, would be a fair one, would be one that you think would be of your interest? So that's really a thought experiment. We've never been in that original position, but if it was a thought experiment and you didn't know, you didn't know whether you were actually in a privileged position or not. And what Rawls just determined is that, well, actually, if we were in that situation that we really didn't know in this original position, we would want to structure our society in such a way that, from a social and economic perspective, that we would want to look at these institutions and make sure that we have fair equality of opportunity for everybody. In case you are the person who might be in the bottom of the totem pole, you want to make sure that even if you are the least advantaged person, you will still be okay. Rawls was not somebody who would say that everything has to be completely equal. He did allow some kind of inequality, but he would say, you know, we can allow economic inequality if it is the case that the social structure is such that when we have some or allow some economic inequality that those who are at the most disadvantaged position would do better than if you have, let's say, absolute equality of economic distribution. So uh, there is, I, I didn't put it on the slide, a term that he uses like maximum, maximize the minimum. So whatever you think the minimum position might be, you want that person, you want people in those situations to be getting as much as possible in case you may be in that situation. So that's where the self-interest part comes in. Okay, that you want, you want to protect yourself, and uh, so that's the difference principle. You will allow some differences of the distribution of economic advantages if it actually can bring the greatest benefit to those who are least advantaged. I don't know if people are familiar with uh, Pima Chodron. She's an, an American Buddhist nun. And she has this phrase, just like me. And I, I listen to her sometimes. She has got very good meditation um, uh, talks and, and teachings about how do we have more compassion towards ourselves 
And, and when we have more compassion towards ourselves, it also would allow us and require us to have more compassion towards other people. Because other people are just like me. So I'm going to read this out in case it's very small there. And she said, as a result of compassion practice, we start to have a deeper understanding of the roots of suffering. We aspire not only that the outer manifestation of suffering decrease, but also that all of us could stop acting and thinking in ways that escalate um, ignorance and confusion. We aspire to be free of fixation and close-mindedness. We aspire to dissolve the myth that we are separate. And she said, I do this sort of thing in all kinds of situations. Standing in the checkout line in the market, I may notice a defiant teenager in front of me and make the aspiration, may he be free of suffering and his causes. In the elevator with a stranger, I might notice her shoes, her hands, the expression on her face. I contemplate that, just like me, she doesn't want stress in her life. Just like me, she has worries. Through our hopes and fears, our pleasures and pains, we are deeply interconnected. And I would say, certainly, having done research in different parts of the world, I really felt people were just like me. But they're not like me in the sense of the social privileges that some of us have, but unearned social privileges. When Rawls talked about the original position, and what he would say is, you didn't earn to be born in Hong Kong versus Canada versus Burundi. You didn't choose that. It was just a matter of luck. So people should not be disadvantaged because of that. You don't want to be disadvantaged by because of that. So at dinner, we were talking about the AIDS crisis uh, from 40 years ago. And what have we learned from that? Uh, in some ways, a lot. In some other ways, we're still learning. And I think it's OK that we always co-learn together. But one thing to learn, and we'll see more uh, later, how the, a lot of the individual's actions were really what prompted systemic or at least government's reactions and responses. So here's a picture of um, protesters lying on, on the ground um, to really pressure the, the Food and Drug Administration to really look more closely in terms of approving drugs um, for, for AIDS patients and HIV patients. But one thing to keep in mind, and I think that, um, and I will show that in the next couple of slides as well, that activist groups actually really have been working together as you know, citizen scientists as well, to really learn much more about various conditions and learn about the global plight that people are going through. And combine the, the protests, high-profile high mass protests, and collaborations with doctors, scientists, and, acti uh, and activists to really see how we can all work together. We can rely on the government, but the government often have to think about, too, that what would my constituents want if you're, if you're living in a democratic society? So if they think that their constituents want them to hoard vaccines because we need to have at least five times for our citizens to feel safe, that's what they would do. But if they think that the citizens would say that we actually need to share because there are many other ways that we can protect ourselves, our infrastructure is much more solid than many other places. And we can also contribute or at least stop um, draining other places that maybe, you know, if we push that as well, that the government will also respond to the constituents. So in, in the two papers I mentioned that I co-authored with one of, our, uh, one of our students, we talked about the, the notions of relational and pragmatic solidarity. I didn't get to choose where I was born, what parents I was born to, but the relational solidarity is to say that it's based on them, just like me, that we have common interests, uh, we have common forms of suffering as well. So how do we actually think about our common interests and try to do things that will achieve the mutual advantage? So when we think about um, any kind of pandemic, and COVID right now, that we really need to have the herd immunity from, from everybody in order to be able to be safe. The many activities even people in higher income countries want to do, want to continue to trade, to travel, to visit their families in various parts of the world, they cannot do that. I have colleagues who work very tirelessly to actually sometimes really try to arrange 
how to allow family members of COVID patients to see the loved ones sometimes when they are breathing the last breaths. Very distressing for many of our health providers because some of the things that we think that are helpful for the suffering we're no longer able to offer. So part of relational solidarity is really to see what we are, how we are in this together and the common good and the common interests are really part of our self-interest as well. The pragmatic solidarity then is to say, well, once we recognize this relational solidarity, what may be some of the explicit actions that we can do to reduce the unnecessary and disparate suffering and to also promote the well-being for all. Sometimes this is tricky partly because this is not free, not money-wise is not free, that when we make the commitment to assist others who are just like me, uh, when we're treating them as more equals just like me, except that they have unequal resources, it does mean that we have to accept the cost as well to provide accessible health care or accept other kinds of restrictions on our own freedom so that we may not be consuming all the scarce resources, maybe vaccines, uh, in such a way that other people may not be able to benefit from. So in you know, winding down and thinking, uh, what can we do, whether it's as Victorians and British Columbians and any kind of global citizen, I want to see how we think about some of these issues. Some of your more health policy may have even better answers to this. In Canada, we're thinking about donation, right? How much Canada is putting money into COVAX, how many of our excessive um, vaccines that we would donate to COVAX or other countries directly. But one concern that I have is donation is very much of using a charity lens. The charity lens is that it is not part of your duty, it's out of the goodness of your heart, which is good, which is in many ways very necessary. But uh, the charity lens is not really getting to what I consider to be the root of the issue, which is a global structural disparity. Because when it is a charity model of a donation, then a country may say, we are not donating until we have reached what we define to be a good goal for us, despite what, whatever else may be happening in other places. Like 4% of you know, some regions being vaccinated. So we may have to really think about how do we actually think about uh, vaccine production, patent regulations, and so on. Particularly during the pandemic, should we think about pharmaceutical products uh, as private commodities that companies can sell for a profit? Or do we want to think about them as global public goods? I don't think that answer is that simple. I, my first degree was in business, and so I do realize that drug companies will just not get into any production, any research, if they think that what they're going to do is going to be all given up for free, or they will be required to do that. Because there are also questions in terms of why should for-profit industries be the ones to be bearing the brunt of the burden. In the article that I mentioned, the articles that I mentioned that um, Yulia and I wrote, one of the things I think about a disparity pathway that may look daunting to us, but in some ways I think actually is a good thing in terms of thinking about how there's a pathway, meaning that there are many different places in the pathway that we can interrupt. So that you may have different actors that may be able to contribute to um, the solution. We could still ask questions, what would a fair industry collaboration look like between the government and pharmaceutical industries or other kinds of industries that may help to rebuild infrastructure? One of the, uh, the issues that I has been really concerning me is in some um, high income countries, because there has been a shortage of healthcare workers, and that there have been um, at least suggestions uh, of hiring travel healthcare providers. Sometimes it may be from other provinces, other states, and in the US. But uh, in the US, and it depends on whether one particular state might require vaccines, uh, vaccinations, and so. People are traveling depending on what their uh, priorities are. But there are certain places that don't have enough even travel nurses, and travel nurses are very expensive in the US right now. Um, and uh, some health systems have been wondering whether they should hire 
uh, travel healthcare providers from other countries that are lower income countries. Because some of these people may want to move to, let's say, the United States and, and have uh, other kinds of opportunities that they may not have in their own country at this point. But I think that that actually is, I, my answer is an absolute no. In the sense that we are already talking about resources in places that are already very much stretched thin. Especially if we are not investing in those areas and then we are taking some of the healthcare providers out when their countries may have been the ones investing into these healthcare personnel and then now we are thinking about benefiting from that especially when we already have relatively good infrastructure so i think that we could perhaps also think about some of these policies or practices that uh, we have been traditionally engaged in how do we think about that when we are in a pandemic and trying to get out of the pandemic so one question I often want to ask my colleagues when they say, you know, when are we going to get out of the pandemic? And one question, Jordan was asking that too, one question I have is like, for whom? Like, who are we talking about? Are we talking about Americans, Canadians? Uh, or are we talking about for the world? Because we are able to do a lot more in many places. Uh, go to concerts, and some places have tens of thousands of people gathering. When there are many other places in the world, people are not even able to get the first shot or other kinds of basic infrastructure. So I think that certainly these are questions to think about. In terms of pads, I mentioned, uh, some of you may have seen this, I think, just yesterday. I can't remember what the date is now. But this, I think, just came out in, in the last day or so. Uh, Moderna, one of the, the vaccine companies, this is the first product they've ever put out on the, in the market. Uh, and they are making a lot of money, and which congratulations to them. But there have been questions in terms of who should be owning the patents of, of their vaccine. The government, the, the National Institute of Health, um, have been working with Moderna in developing the vaccines. But there were a lot of disputes for months in terms of whether the NIH scientists should be able to get um, co-ownership, or NIH should get co-ownership with Moderna for, uh, for the patents. Partly because if the, the government can have partial ownership, then they can also help to decide how to license the patent. How, how, do, you license, how do you grant license to other countries to make um, vaccines in some places? Moderna initially actually fought it for the longest time to say that the NIH scientists had nothing to do with this particular formula, uh, so that they should not be named. But it just came out that they, I don't know exactly what the agreement is yet, um, but that they will at least have some kind of co-ownership. It's not only just that scientists being involved, but the US government actually put in a lot of money um, with the development, to speed up the development, and also commitment uh, to buy many doses from Moderna, millions of doses from Moderna. So I think that certainly when we talk about, and I mentioned earlier, in thinking about uh, government and private collaborations, how do we actually plan these collaborations in advance? so that when we have some success, which I think would be a good thing, that we can really distribute um, the benefits equitably. So in closing, I really like this quote by Malcolm X. When I is replaced with we, even illness becomes wellness. So I think that especially when we're thinking about a pandemic, if we only think about the I, we're not going to have wellness, not for ourselves, because it's and not for others either. Thank you. Usually I pop up and facilitate, even though it's an intimate gathering, but if there, uh, we have some time for Q&A. Ruben, can you help me with the time, though? And how much time do we have for q &A? Oh, we've got plenty of time. We've got plenty of time. Okay, so you'll let me know when we're getting closer. Thank you so much for the talk. And uh, I guess I'll take this off to be at the front, but thank you so much for, for your talk, a wide-ranging talk, and raising a lot of issues that I think are probably in a lot of our minds as well. So does anyone want to start off with a, a question? Yeah. 
shift how like intellectual property is conceived of in the health field at all? That's a very good question, and I think that's part of the reason why many uh, pharmaceutical companies or industries are very concerned about that. Right? So uh, many of them would be quite open to talk about donation. And first of all, donations you can write off donations as well, right? so as, as your charity contribution. Uh, but they do not want to disrupt the 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 whole idea of patents. And so they would say that that actually would be what will ruin any kind of research and development and innovation. So, um, so they would say that, I'll, because I, I mentioned in the Moderna, this is the first product they have actually been able to bring to market. So they would say, we have spent years on developing, and we never knew whether we would have anything at all. And so if we now have a blockbuster, even though in a tragic situation, um, and then we are now changing uh, patent regulations because of the pandemic, um, the next time with AIDS epide uh, epidemic and pandemic at the, uh, at the time, there were also questions in terms of whether um, we can use compulsory licensing to allow places like Brazil to, to make cheaper versions of drugs. And so some people are, are very concerned about that. Now, others on the other side would say that actually the whole patent system is broken. That perhaps it's not a bad idea to say that it should change for other pharmaceutical products either. I don't know whether you have certain thoughts on that. No, that's all good. Yeah, it seems like a really complicated area. So. Yeah, yeah. But, but you would hear the head of states from uh, various high-income countries that would say that they did not want to um, disrupt the patent system. They would rather donate. When you say donate, it sounds great, right? You can have some numbers that you can just put on the front page. Much easier to say how generous you are. When you say, can we allow compulsory licensing, uh, allowing other countries to be able to develop, you don't know what the number might be. It's, it's much harder to just put it on social media. I guess maybe just to follow up with that, I mean, when I go to the grocery store, you know, I can buy the name brand of, of Tylenol or aspirin, and, and then they also have the generic brand as well. You know, those, the, br the brand name, you know, products are still making, those companies are still making quite a bit of money, even mm -hmm. though there is a generic uh, version out there. So um, is there no way that that could possibly happen with COVID as well? The, the I think thing. that probably there's one, is there, is there no way, I wouldn't say there's no way, but, uh, um, I think that especially when, when we think about how we, we, we need, I do think that we need to really rethink the whole patent system. Not to say that we should not have patents, copyrights. We, we have certain kinds of privileges, uh, but at the same time, what would be, what would be a fair arrangement? Right? Like you said, even if, let's say 20 years later when the patent runs out, you are still making, you, you're still selling your brand name painkillers, right? So it's not that you're not selling them. And many patients, um, for one reason or another, we still prefer buying the brand name because they have used it for so long. Right? So they're still making money. But it's particularly when we think about, I mentioned Moderna earlier, that many drug companies, uh, when they develop the, the drug, a lot of the basic sciences have been done at universities that are often tax funded. And so how do we also factor that into consideration? Um, so I, I, I do think that we have to really relook at the whole patent system, not to say that they don't, shouldn't have it, but many companies also are using the patent system to uh, extend the patent by now finding other uses for their product, uh, tweak certain things, and so that they can extend it for another however many years. So that's when people say, that's unfair. Um, and you may also want to ask, going back to the question about other kinds of drugs, Many drugs have been tried, uh, um, research of vaccines have been researched in different countries. You have, to, you have to test the vaccines in different countries to know whether they work for the population there, given the particular specifics, the real world trials. So there may also be a question that once you have benefited from the local people's labor, what would be your obligations to those places? We have now learned a lot more about how vaccines work in different conditions. 
We have learned a lot more about different drugs for different populations. Um, and so, don't we owe the local economy, the local people, something? Um, and so, when we think about patents, and we have to think about whether patents should only be used in certain circumstances, in certain regions, for a certain period of time. And is there a lot of government funding for pharmaceuticals? I mean, their, their only source is not just their profits, I mean, for development. Yeah, so for development, it's, it's a very interesting question because sometimes the holder of a patent initially may not have been a company. It may be a scientist. And the scientist may be selling that to or transferring it to a particular company. So what, what I was saying earlier, sometimes um, the revenue is, of course, often from the profits, right? But one thing about, I don't have the numbers in front of me right now, but one thing, not to say that pharmaceutical companies are, are not putting a lot of money into R&D, research and development, but um, uh, Marsha, Marsha Angel, and she was the, uh, I think she was the president of the American Medical Association, but she was, she was an editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, I believe. And then she wrote a book called something like The Truth About Drug Companies. And she talked about how, like, when, yes, of course drug companies put a lot of money into R&D, but they perhaps put even more money into marketing. So uh, when you put them together, at least, for the, at least for the drugs that do make it to the market, that very often when you compare then the post-approval uh, stage, how much money companies are putting into the market whether for, in, directly to healthcare providers and, and so on and so forth, and, and advertising in some countries, uh, then it's, it's not just about your, uh, the cost for the research and development. And so when companies say that we have to charge this much for this particular drug, uh, where do you come up with that number? Sometimes you also see that when a pharmaceutical company has been merged or has been purchased by another company, and all of a sudden they are um, jacking up the price, and some of you may have heard of the EpiPen fiasco, right? Mm -hmm. I had to carry EpiPen for a while, and, and uh, that was in Canada, it was like $22 with, in my, as my copay or something like that. And so when all of a sudden it went up to like 700 something, was there any additional R&D? It's exactly the same drug. Nothing was done. So I think it's stories like that that get people very skeptical about the um, some of those arguments about R and D costs, and what what would what would be a fair profit for any particular industry, and then during the pandemic, what would be a fair profit uh, for drug industry? Yeah, what's the longevity of the vaccines that are stockpiling? They're not the best before they do they? That's a very good question. So. I don't know what the uh, exact longevity is, but once you have taken it out, for example, the deep freezer, then it's a much shorter time. One thing I would tell you is that a lot of drugs, a lot of the vaccines in North America have been wasted. Wasted in the sense of because they were in vials that may have five doses or six doses, depending on which one it is. And when we were initially, we, you know, in different uh, provinces and states, um, uh, scheduling people for the vaccines, and actually there were people who would not show up. So you may have already thawed the vaccines, the vials, and if you don't have people coming, then you have to throw them away. And um, I am part of a health system in the US, and at some point I was very distressed that if we did not have more people getting vaccinated, tens of thousands of the doses can go to waste because they would be expiring. But it's not like you can, at that point, just ship to another place to have them be used because there are all these other kinds of regulations about importing and exporting. And especially for vaccines that require deep freezer, you can only have so many transfer points. So the expiry date is not even just on the time that it's being manufactured. I think it was like one of the vaccines, like six months or something. And then, But it's really that once you have transferred, because once you had left the original freezer, going to another spot, then your, uh, the longevity, the, the, the timeline is much shorter. So, so unless you're producing the vaccines with already the intention of it going somewhere, then for some of these vaccines that require the special refrigeration, uh, 
that would be much more problem than I do to just do that. Shame to waste. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so so we have lots of people who talk about the individual liberty to not get vaccinated, uh, even though then we are wasting the resources that many people cannot have. Right? And so I I, I, you know, I, I do believe in individual liberty, but is there also the solidarity that when we're getting vaccinated, we're also protecting other people? Um, but there are people who would rather the vaccines go to waste, partly because there's a lot of mistrust still and distrust in the system. Uh, and there's some who just hold strong to the notion that it's my liberty and that nobody can tell me what to do. And, and actually, going back to the patent point, I think it's also very sad, even though I understand the distrust, uh, I do know people, personally, who would say, I don't want to get the vaccine because now they're really talking about the third shot. Companies just want to make money. They don't want to make a vaccine that would last forever because how are they going to make money? Okay, so, so there are you know, conspiracies or concerns and, and so on. So there's some people who, who don't want to get it because they said, you know, aren't we just then benefiting the companies of the industries? Yeah, yeah, I'm curious. Thanks, Nina, for the talk. Uh, I'm curious about this kind of concept of like the I versus the we and the kind of solidarity piece. Because I think part of the conversation that we've already seen politically happen is well, we shut down our vaccine development capacity in Canada, so we need to build our own capacity so that we can develop and make our own vaccines here which is a very inward looking kind of solution, right? That instead of working globally in a more open and sharing context, that we actually just do everything ourselves so that we don't need to worry about the others. And I'm curious just a little bit about your reflections on some of that narrative of like, what happens when we don't have our own capacity and therefore we are reliant on others, even though we are a rich nation. Right, right. Yes, yeah, so that's a really excellent point. And I think that, you know, I also thought at the time that, yeah, only if we have the capacity and we didn't have to worry about whether we would be getting the shipment from other places. But I, then I actually want to say, well, actually, I don't think that's a bad idea. Um, it's, it's not inward looking if we actually think broadly again. Right? So it shouldn't just be Canada having that capacity. Various parts of the quote unquote global south should have the capacity as well. So if we have the compulsory licensing um, agreement that allows other countries to develop the vaccines in their places, we, if we can actually do that knowledge translation and the know-how to other places so that they can also build their own plans, uh, then you don't have to have the, all these different transfer points. Then other places can be also more self-sufficient. Canada, we have to wait, but um, we have the money, right? We knew that we would be able to buy it. And that we're not donating until we have got our own share. So uh, whereas in many other places, they want the license. And some of the pharmaceutical companies would say that we, we would donate to you. We're not going to share the license because you wouldn't know how to do it anyway. That's condescending. Uh, that's also perpetuating, right? Because if, if you don't have the knowledge uh, transfer, then of course people wouldn't know. Um, but what makes us think that we are so special that we are the only ones who can do it? So, uh, so I, I'm not against Canada building um, the capacity. I'm just more for other places also being able to build that capacity. I wonder if I could follow up on solidarity also, mm -hmm. Anita. I just, I'm, I'm trying to think around the interface between what seems an ethical argument and the sort of very also practical matters that you're dealing with in, right. in your talk. And so, I mean, I wonder um, how does that sense of ethical responsibility uh, or uh, an ethical grounding for solidarity interface with um, with politics? I guess, and and in some ways, you know, I hadn't thought about. I mean, I guess I, you know, Rawls kind of hover anyway. I've read for some time Rawls, and maybe hovers kind of in the background of my ethical imagination. But in hearing it tonight, it sounded almost like the opposite of politics. That is, you know, in fact, we know very precisely where we stand, and, and folks who have, uh, who know that they're not among the least uh, advantaged in relation to something like vaccine world have been very much ensuring that they 
they don't, that notion of risk, in other words, operates very differently within the kind of actual politics of the pandemic than mm -hmm. risk might operate through that kind of screen that you had generated. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, are you, I just thought, but I mean, are you optimistic about this form of solidarity? What would you say to someone who doesn't feel that optimism, <laughs> who doesn't see that solidarity? Right, right. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned that because um, the, the two articles I mentioned that, that we published, the first one that we published, in one of, uh, one of our last paragraphs, I talked about the self-interest part in the pandemic, that unless we all have access to the infrastructure, vaccines, and so on and so forth, we will all be in this for a long time. So for self-interest reasons, let's put aside politics. Uh, you want other places to have vaccines as well, because otherwise, you just cannot travel to those places that you otherwise might be able to do that. And one of the reviewers said that, well, if you're really talking about solidarity, don't you want to just stick to that ethical commitment to solidarity that, you know, push aside self-interest? And maybe that's my lack of optimism, <laughs> that um, because we are not in the original position, I guess, not all of us have the moral imagination. Uh, and, and I don't think necessarily it's a, a, a failure, but it's just that we are not necessarily, when I say we right now, maybe those of us who live in North America and have been very much in the culture about individual liberty and, and um, individual accomplishments. And, um, I've had students before that who would say that, you know, I don't want to donate to the university after I graduate because it has done nothing for me, you know, and I keep thinking, Wow, you know, especially in the publicly funded place, and you think that nobody has done anything for you. You know, all the infrastructure that has been built, the land that we're on, all our ancestors, all the things that people who have come before us that have made it possible, your parents and so on. So, so, so I, I am not that optimistic, um, but which is partly why I think that Rawls, in, in some ways, Rawls' idea could be actually quite celebrate in the sense of, well, you know, I mean, in, in some ways we are also talking about self-interest. So at least the self-interest part I think is easy enough to take in. But isn't that argument failing also? Like, haven't we kind of observed the failure of that argument politically? I mean, because we've heard that argument, and yet, you know, the co uh, COVAX and, and so on, you know, people are, are people more interested in being able to go to a concert in, you know, New York than they are in in that argument, essentially. I yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know either because I, you know, I, I, when I get kind of Socratic about it, I just say that you know, people who may not do the right things because of ignorance. I mean, I, I mean, I, I could be fooling myself in thinking that. Um, I'm not sure. I think many people are fatigued by even the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether this next surge in, in or this this current surge in Europe. Um, or potential winter surge is going to make a difference right? because some people really think that the pandemic is over and why is the government still saying we have to do all these things, right? Uh, but the reality is it's not over, it's definitely not over. Some of the states in, in the U.S. are using crisis standards of care. So I'm hoping that at some point we will have the humility to see that the pandemic is not over just because we say it's over and we want it to be over. Um, so, but I don't know. I mean, I want to see what other people are more optimistic. <laughs> there are questions in the back? Yeah, no, no, just competing with each other. Um, yeah, just building off that, not trying to like continue to probe down that same line of questioning. I guess when you were talking about building solidarity um, mm -hmm. through like bonds to common suffering and then you were talking about you know the root causes of some of the ails and some of the things that we're seeing um, in this pandemic but I think you know as well before that and, and these things that you name sometimes slightly with um, whether it's you know like imperialism and, and nationalism and colonialism and mm -hmm. racism um, then you know I'm not super optimistic that this these things will be resolved in time to you know, address the uh, global vaccine state, mm -hmm. um, but are there are there then social movements and solidarity efforts that you've seen in your research um, that maybe transcend this you know pandemic, but that are working to bring that moral question uh, you know to light and to push maybe governments to make more moral actions? 
Yeah, I realized how I actually took up one slide and I had a couple of other pictures of the, the climate change uh, activism more recently. Uh, and then another one, there was some, um, I think they were from Harvard, and some of the clinicians uh, were, were standing, uh, were protesting in front of the headquarters of various uh, vaccine producers in the U.S. And they had, they staged almost like an art exhibit, like um, artificial like, human bones behind them. We had a picture of it. And, and they pledged to not take uh, the, the for them would be the booster shots until, you know, at least um, after the end of the year, even though they are eligible because they are healthcare providers and so on and so forth. And so, like with climate change and how it actually become more and more front and center, it's not just because of different storms in different places that are acting in very different ways that we know climate change is here, but I mentioned about the AIDS activism. It's really a, a lot of the social movements that are really getting people to listen. And so, um, I, I, you know, maybe I do have, as an educator, I do have some optimism. Uh, the younger, especially the younger people who are paying a, a lot more attention in, in terms of what is happening around the world. Uh, I, I mean, I, I don't think that um, people are necessarily trying to be evil about it. I, I just don't think that people actually have all the information about what the disparity actually looks like. And having really enough information about how we are in a pandemic and we actually will not be able to get out of it until we all are safe and are protecting each other as well. Uh, so I, I do think that there is some movement right now. I mean, the WHO has really made that call out. One, uh, so the, the, these physicians just say that, you know, one concern we have is that we are only some individuals. Um, can we really move the needle or not? They don't know. But again, most people who are activists, uh, they don't know that their one person's action is going to make a difference or not. Right? So I only know that if we don't do anything, then nothing is going to happen. And so I have to do my part, and, and others do their part. And um, so, but that's why I do sometimes that the, the pessimistic part of me slip in more discussion about the self interest because. I, I told my mom, for example, at the very beginning of, I don't even know if it was a pandemic yet. Uh, she lives in Hong Kong. And I said at the time, you know, the border between Hong Kong and China closed and uh, uh, be because of the outbreaks in China. And I said that this is going to be a huge problem for supply chain. People are going to have ripple effect all around the world. And if you look at now grocery stores, everything is more expensive because of supply chain problems. I think that when people have a better understanding in terms of how a lot of these issues are interconnected, that hopefully they will wake up a little bit more. Do we have another question right beside the last question? Yeah, I, I guess, you know, I thought first of all I want to say that it's a great presentation. I really like the succinct uh, explanation of the veil of ignorance. And I've been thinking about the veil of ignorance and the I versus the we. And, you know, uh, theory of justice, again, I guess, great work had a fair bunch of critiques leveled at it, um, particularly that in the original position, it's this individual operating from what I guess Rawls calls the Archimedean position, um, is assessing the structures of justice. And I'm, I guess my question is, do you think that working from the Rawlsian framework presupposes an emphasis on individualism that could undercut or undermine the sense of community needed for solidarity? That's a very good question. So I, mean, I, I mostly talked about his second principle of justice. I didn't really actually talk about that. He actually very much emphasized the liberty principle, right? Uh, and there are actually many feminist philosophers, for example, who think that actually the whole liberalism of the, the John Rawls is very much to individualism. Um, and versus a much more, I, I adopt more actually of a, a feminist approach of relational solidarity and really thinking about uh, care for others. Right? So, um, so I, I don't disagree with you on that. And then in some ways, uh, am I asking for too much? And that, you know, that in some ways that we won't get there. At the same time, are we asking for too little? Because in, in, in the, the broader Walsian way of thinking about justice and li the, the principle of liberty, that you still put much more emphasis on what it would be the inviolable rights of, of individuals. Right? And so 
Uh, some people may use that to say that well, actually there are lots of liberty restrictions that we're putting on individuals now and that maybe that would be challenged as well. I'm not sure. Well, that's a good question. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? I might ask one more, just as you do I have time? <laughs> At least another 10 minutes, so. Yeah. So I have a question about, we, we, um, about uh, coverage of, of the pandemic, and maybe especially scholarly contributions to coverage. Um, I was I was set off by, by an op-ed in the Globe and Mail about um, third doses for immune-compromised folks being immune-compromised, uh, you know, on the BC list of you know immune-compromised folks. I uh, was attentive to it, um, but I found that um, uh, perhaps the pressures to publish in a public venue like that um, pushed against. A, a more subtle argument around th th that issue, so that we might, I would think that any scholarly treatment of immune compromised people might distinguish among different immune, so it was an argument in favor of shots for immune uh, compromised folks, but it seemed to me very blunt, very alarmist, very alarming, uh, uh, and I just wondered, what are the challenges in speaking into those public environments where kind of uh, bold, extravagant claims um, kind of might uh, get airtime? Uh, and as an academic trying to write, so, so coming from an environment where subtlety and distinctions mm -hmm. are valued and then trying to move that into public discussion, I just wonder what you've observed about that process or whether you yourself have found yourself caught in, in that at all, or and, and sort of how you, how well you think academics are able to contribute more subtle perspectives into these conversations. May I ask a clarification question about that particular piece? Alarm, alarming to say that people, you must go get your uh, additional shot if you were. Well, it was it was, it was prior to the provincial decision, so it was a kind of advocacy piece around that, and it oh, seemed to me to use, um, uh, you know, so it it it, it, it used very alarming. Uh, it sort of started with very alarming uh, claims that se that didn't seem perfectly well founded. I did some kind of background okay. research and so on. And it struck me that you know this was something that the the author, the academic, believed in, yeah. but. I would have to imagine that in order to get it into the wider circulating paper in Canada, there have been compromises in this, the subtlety of the argument that might otherwise have been uh, presented. And I think you know that kind of work pushed towards making me and other Canadians fearful and concerned about our vaccines and less likely to think right. globally. And yeah. I it's a very good question. I think that partly because, you know, in some ways we have been 20 some months into the pandemic, but we are still learning a lot throughout this pandemic. And, and I do think that the subtlety has often been lost about how complex the whole situation is. So one of the, one of the questions that I had, I think we may have been talking about that um, at, at dinner earlier too, that I was puzzled by in relation to mandatory vaccination policies. As I said, I am very much you know, pro-vaccination, so I certainly think that people should get vaccinated. But in places that have already, let's say, 90% of people vaccinated, and you may have various kinds of uh, ways to encourage even more vaccination. So there have, been, there have been questions in terms of what do we do for the people, the 10%, the 5% left, who are not vaccinated. In some cases, they said, that, well, you know what, these people are going to be ruining all our lives, and so we should not allow them to be doing A, B, C, and D. But my concern is that, and so in, in one situation, the question is, do we allow people to come back to the office or to, to the workplace? And, and, then in, and in one place, they said that, no, anyone who is not vaccinated by the state, you have to uh, not, you have to be taken off your work schedule and so on and so forth. And I was puzzled by it in the sense that I thought, well, but now if most of us are fully vaccinated, 
We are safer than ever. And these people who have been working in the office, who were not vaccinated, but now as more of us are vaccinated, they are also safer than ever. So now I don't have the number to tell you how much safer than, than before, but even common sense would tell me that, well, it's much more complex than just to say, people who are not vaccinated, you are going to be a major threat to everybody else. Uh, they are, they are, but how big of a risk uh, I'm not sure yet. Right? So I think that we do have to have more nuanced discussions. But the more nuanced discussions is also to allow us to have less, I think, divisiveness. Because in, in particularly in, in, in the US, it is very divided uh, that your vaccine uh, proof is almost like your political identity. And I don't understand why it has to be that way. And so. Uh, so I do think that if we have more nuanced discussion rather than uh, a longest kind of discussion, especially at this at this time of the, the pandemic, that may help us to have more actually in some ways solidarity to say that okay, so are there other harm reduction approach that we can talk about together, so that people don't think that we are against each other because of the vaccination status. Um, I haven't been in the office, so I don't know. I've been asked to grind with this stuff. <laughs> well, thank you all. Uh, I know some of you attended a few of these uh, uh, of our of our uh, lectures this fall. We we'll have a new slate of uh, lectures, and the title, Ruben, you told me before we came in, but it's res resurgence. In the uh, yeah, resurgence, decolonizing the city. So uh, shifting gears to a somewhat different. Every uh, kind of semester of the academic year, we we do a different theme, and so yeah, we're. We're shifting from emergence to resurgence. Yeah, so. so from emergence to resurgence. And if you enjoyed the lecture tonight, as I did, or some of the other ones, we're, we're set a max for attendance here for 30, which is way below the official limit. But if each of you brought one person to the January uh, lecture, we'd have a few more uh, folks in the room and get a little bit back towards um, people coming together in rooms and, discussing ideas together. So, um, But thank you all for uh, being here today, and Anita for making the, the trip over and surviving the rain and, and wind, and for a really important and uh, challenging discussion tonight. Thank you. So thank you. Please do it.